Welcome to our evening event featuring Dr. Phyllis Zagano on women deacons past, present, and future. My name is Eric Goldtrin. I'm the director of the Church in the 21st Century Center, and I'm excited about our series of events this semester on the theme of living Catholicism, roles and relationships for the contemporary world. The question of women deacons is not only an open question, but a critical question for the future of ministry in the Catholic Church. And we're really honored to have Phyllis here walk us through that. And she's do, she has done amazing work on this, as many as you, of you know. I welcome each of you here to campus. Uh, Phyllis is going to speak for about 30 to 40 minutes, and we welcome then your questions, and then we'll all have the option of getting home in time for the baseball game. <laughs> so that I don't keep you any longer from the first pitch, um, I want to welcome Sister Mary Sweeney from the campus ministry uh, to introduce Phyllis tonight. My understanding is they've been good friends for 25 years. So, Sister Mary. Thank you, Eric. I too want to add my welcome to all of you here to the Cadogan Center on campus. Dr. Phyllis Sagano is an internationally acclaimed Catholic scholar who has lectured throughout the United States and in Canada, Europe, and Australia. A graduate of Marymount College, Tarrytown, New York, Phyllis holds a doctorate from the State University of New York at Stony Brook and master's degrees in communications, literature, and theology. Phyllis is the author or editor of 16 books in religious studies, including Women in Catholicism, Gender, Communion, and Authority, published by Macmillan in 2011, and Holy Saturday, An Argument for the Restoration of the Female Diaconate in the Catholic Church, a Crossroads published in 2000. Both of these books won awards from the Catholic Press Association. Phyllis's newer books include Women Deacons, Past, Present, Future, and Women in Ministry, Emerging Questions on the Diaconate, which was published by Paulist in 2012. Phyllis is general editor of the new liturgical press series titled Spirituality and History, and her cross-cultural anth anthology, Mystici Mysticism and the Spiritual Quest, will be published by Paulist Press in November. Phyllis is the author of hundreds of articles and reviews that have been published in both popular and scholarly journals, and her syndicated column, Just Catholic, appears in the National Catholic Reporter. Phyllis has taught at Fordham, Boston University, where we met, and at Yale University, and currently holds a research appointment at Hofstra University in Hempstead, New York. On behalf of C21, and personally, it's a great pleasure to welcome Phyllis here this evening, so please join me in that welcome. Thank you, my dear. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mary. It's, uh, it's wonderful, it really is wonderful to be here, and thank you to Eric and to Karen and to uh, all the staff of C21 who have who've coordinated the event um, and brought us here. It is so good to be back here in Boston. I must say, it's a little daunting to be speaking here in the former Chancery Building <laughs> of the Archdiocese of Boston. I mean, I, I do talk about women in the church. But, but tonight is not the first time I've talked about these matters here on this side of the road. On November 30th, 1987, I sat at a table in the conference room at 2101 Commonwealth Avenue, the old cardinal's residence. I sat at that table with the old cardinal, and we talked about church, and we talked about women in it. I listened to the tape the other day. The fact that I got in there and sat at that table is now, in retrospect, pretty amazing. 
As you well know, not everyone finds space at the Catholic table. In my work, in my research, in my writing, in my speaking, I try to make space at the table for the women among us who want to teach and to preach and to minister within the system, as it were. I try to find space there at the table for the women theologians and ministers among us. I try to find room for the women with PhDs who think and write and daily reimagine church, for the women with Master of Divinity degrees who are formed and trained as Catholic ministers, formed and trained to do as their ancient predecessors did, to teach and to preach and to console, to baptize and to witness marriages, to anoint the sick and to bury the dead. But I don't do priesthood. The discussion about women as Catholic priests is not mine. My work, now for nearly 30 years, has been on the diaconal ministry of service in the Catholic churches, and specifically on the ways in which women have been and can again be included in that diaconal ministry. That is, my work is on restoring women to the ordination, ordained diaconate to the order of deacons. So I've been reading a little Italian lately. Uh, by, by now you probably know that Pope Francis called directly for women to have a more incisive presence in the church in his late summer conversations published in 16 Jesuit journals worldwide. Unfortunately for the English-speaking world, America Magazine dropped two sentences from the section on women. But before we get to that, let's take a look at what Francis said last July on the airplane trip back from World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro. You'll remember that the Pope stood for 80 minutes chatting in Italian with the journalists there on Shepherd One. The news reports were all over his, who am I to judge, remark about, in his words, gay persons. Those news reports did not focus on his comments about women in the church. More importantly, to me at least, no news account focused on the actual question that elicited his positive remarks on women in church structure and ministry. The question came in Italian from Jean-Marie Gainois, the religion editor of the French language daily Le Figaro, and also on behalf of a colleague from the French Catholic newspaper Le Croix. Gainois said to the Pope, you said that a church without women loses its fruitfulness. Then Gainois asked about women as deacons and about women heading major portions of the church's bureaucracy. What concrete measures will you take, Gainois asked. For instance, a feminine diaconate or a woman as the head of a dicastery? Francis's answer was direct. The Pope said, quote, the role of the woman in the church must not only end as mom, worker, limited. No, it is something else. I think that we need to move further ahead in the development of this role and charisma of the woman. Then Francis continued, I think that we haven't yet come up with a deep theology of women in the church. She can only do this, only do that. Now she's an altar server. Now she reads the readings. She is president of Caritas. But, but there is more. Francis said, we need to make a profound theology of the woman. That is what I think. Now to me, that's a yes to women in the diaconate. Then in August of this year, Pope Francis sat down for conversations with Antonio Spadero, the Jesuit editor of La Civiltà Cattolica, which has been published by the Society of Jesus in Italy since 1850. The journal has a circulation of 15,000 subscribers. Each issue of the journal is directly reviewed by the Vatican Secretariat of State and appears with the Secretariat's approval. It is the unofficial voice of the Holy See. In a long article, the result of three individual meetings with the Pope, Spadero presents Francis's own words on all manner of church questions. Questions about belonging and not belonging. Questions about authority and about ministry. Questions about prayer and questions about being a Jesuit. The questions I was interested in were about women in the church. The interview was published in 16 Jesuit journals. 
in Britain, in Germany, in Chile, in France, in Slovakia, in Italy, in the United States, in Portugal, in Switzerland, in Greece, in Spain, in Venezuela, in Sweden, in Belgium, in Hungary, in Croatia. The translation from Italian to English was managed by America, the New York-based Jesuit Weekly. The complete English translation runs approximately 12,000 words. For whatever reasons, they, they say it was space or a production error, America's editors cut about 2,000 words, maybe more or less 17% from the authorized text. Let me remind you, this was at least a semi-official text. There's but one section wholly on women, yet from within the single 306-word section on women in the church, on the place of women in ministry, America's editors cut or inadvertently dropped 57 words. Not that much, you say. Well, maybe. But the words America removed have real meaning because they color the entire section. Without these words, the Pope is saying something different. Without these words, the Pope does not sound like the Pope Francis who has caught the world's eye and who promises new things. So what did Francis and Spadaro say? And what does it matter anyway? Well, to begin with, Spadaro asked only one question about women. He and Francis spent only 2.5% of their time talking about the possibilities for half the church. Then that was reduced to the point that only 2% of the interview's direct quotes and commentary focused on women in the church. Now, I know that's not exactly correct. There are comments in other sections about women, and I do not accuse Pope Francis of spending 98% of his time thinking only about men and their contributions to our church, to its governance and ministry. But it certainly does seem that even good Pope Francis is focused, first of all, on men. How can he not be? For example, I'll use the number metaphorically rather than really. Can we agree that 98% of liturgical ministers at any given papal mass are male? From my perspective, and I will agree wholeheartedly with Ignatius of Loyola here, deeds are more important than words. But deeds begin with words, and despite the few words about women and ministry in the Spadero article, and really none in Francis's more recent conversations with La Repubblica editor Eugenio Scalfari, I think there's reason for hope. At the end of this most recent article, Francis reportedly promised another interview in which he will speak about the role of women in the church. And just about 10 days ago, he said that women are called to service, not servitude but back to America. As soon as America's Jesuit editor, Matt Malone, had the omission pointed out to him by the editor of the National Catholic Reporter, just as soon as Malone had the error pointed out, he posted the missing words online with a footnote. Later, on September 30th, the entire translation appeared on the America website. More recently, the October 14th issue of America has a note about the editing. It certainly could have been what the magazine called a production error, but let's talk about epistemology here. How do we know what we know about what the Pope says? And therefore, how does what we know color what we think about what the Pope can or might do? That is, how does what we know color what we think about what the Pope is able to do and about what the Pope is likely to do? America's edits, one sentence of commentary and one sentence from Francis, change the perspective of the entire interview. Spadero writes, and what about the role of women in the church? The Pope has said, has made reference to this issue on several occasions. He took up this question again on the return flight from Rio de Janeiro, asserting that a profound theology of women has not yet been elaborated. So I ask, what should be the role of women in the church? What can be done to make their role more visible today? And in the America version, Francis answers, I am wary of a solution that can be reduced to a kind of female machismo, because a woman has a different makeup than a man. What I hear about the role of women is often inspired by an ideology of machismo. America printed the rest of Francis's answer, but to me, here Francis sounds like an angry young man who wants to turn the altars around, put back those altar rails, and keep those interfering women at more than arm's length. So now listen to the entire commentary. 
and the entire response with the missing sentences. My point is a little stronger if I use my own literal translation, Spadaro writes. And what about the role of women in the church? The Pope has made reference to this issue on several occasions. In an interview, he had affirmed that the feminine presence in the church had not fully emerged because the temptation of male chauvinism has not left space to make visible the role women are entitled to within the community. He took up this question again during his return trip from Rio de Janeiro, asserting that a profound theology of women has not yet been elaborated. So I ask, what should be the role of women in the church? What can be done to make their role more visible today? And Francis answers, it is necessary to widen the space for a more incisive feminine presence in the church. I'm wary of a solution that can be reduced to a kind of female machismo because a woman has a different makeup than a man. But what I hear about the role of women is often inspired by an ideology of machismo. Women are asking deep questions that must be addressed. A church cannot be herself without women in a role. The woman is essential for the church. Mary, a woman, is more important than the bishops. I say this because we must not confuse the function with the dignity. We must therefore investigate further the role of women in the church. Only by making this step will it be possible to better reflect on their function within the church. The feminine genius is needed wherever we make important decisions. The challenge today is this, to think about the specific place of women also in those places where the authority of the church is exercised for various areas of the church. Now, we could be here all night parsing words and context, but for the sake of the single question about the role of women in the church, let's just focus on what Francis said, on what the news cycle that followed the story missed. There's an Italian expression, non c'è spazio qui. There's no place, no room, no, no, no room here. Francis turns the expression on its head. What the immediate news cycle missed is that he said directly that the space must be widened. More room must be made for women. Francis said the church has to open up for the role women are entitled to within the community, within the church. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what Benedict XVI said when a priest of Rome asked him about women in the church in 2006. Benedict said, I quote, however, it is proper to ask whether in ministerial service can we not offer more space, more positions of responsibility to women? Even earlier in Christopher Daly's laity, the 1987 document from the Synod on the laity, a synod of bishops, I might add, on the laity, in Christopher Daly's laity, that word spazio appears. The synod document advises that John Paul II's apostolic letter, Mulieris Dignitatum, ought, quote, enlighten and guide the Christian response to the most frequently asked questions oftentimes so crucial on this place, the spazio, that women can have and ought to have in church and in society. Well, in 2006, and certainly by today, there have arisen two questions about the place that women can and ought to have in the church. One question is about ministry, and the other, I believe, is about governance. The answer? Let's begin with governance as did Pope Benedict XVI in 2006. Can we not offer more positions of responsibility to women? Of course we can. Just after the Spadaro article and interview of Francis, the giant Spanish daily newspaper, El Pais, suggested female cardinals were in the works. That in and of itself is an interesting question. It digresses from ministry a bit, but let's think about that here, specifically as it involves governance. Why not have women cardinals? The Le Figaro religion editor essentially asks that on the Rio airplane, can there not be more women as, can there not be women as dicastery heads? The Pope seemed to say yes. Well, a woman as a dicastery head would somewhat unremarkably be elevated to the cardinalate. She would be a lay cardinal, the first in a century and a half, but she would be a cardinal. Of course, there's canon law to deal with. Canon 351 says those pre-promoted cardinals are men freely selected by the Roman pontiff who are at least in the order of priesthood. But either a derogation from the law or a modification to it is all that would be necessary. And you have to believe if any pope would do it, it would be Francis. 
In fact, there's no real reason a woman cannot be elevated to cardinal, even at the next consistory. There's a wonderful story around that recounts that when he, asked about, when he was asked about women cardinals, Pope John Paul II said he had already asked Mother Teresa, and she said no. <laughs> Which is exactly the point. For her own reasons, and I'm sure there were many, Mother Teresa did not have time for the pomp, for the meetings, for the actual work of being a cardinal. She was doing ministry. She did not want to be an official advisor to the Pope. She seemed to be do, doing more advising by what she was doing anyway. We'll come back to that, because the future of women in ministry is really what I'm talking about. Cardinals have power. Currently, Pope Francis has gathered a group of eight cardinals to advise him. The G8, as it has been called, met for the first time in Rome early this month. The group includes one Vatican official and cardinals from North, Central, and South Americas, from Africa, Asia, Europe, and Australia. At their first meeting, they worked on three action issues a reform of the Roman Curia, an examination of the role of the Vatican's Secretariat of State, and an examination of the role of the laity. This latter discussion resulted in the announcement of a synod on family life to be held in October 2014. But, but where are the women? In the photo of the G8 plus the Pope, every single person is male. It is, to my mind, a problem of perspective it is, to my mind, a problem of inclusiveness. The eight men were chosen by their positions. Each heads a major diocese and one is a Vatican official. Each, as we know, is a cardinal. Many others are typically elevated to the cardinalate, members of the diplomatic corps, dicastery officials, and even theologians once in a while. But the largest cadre of cardinals are they with the most influence, and they with the most influence are they with the largest span of governance as patriarchs or archbishops. So the question is not how can a woman be an advisor to the pope, rather the question becomes how do we include women in church governance? Women cardinals would be advisors to the pope and that would be a good thing, but inevitably they would be chosen for the additional staff position of cardinal because they already held staff positions, not line positions, most probably as heads of dicasteries. There would be employees, potentially very high-powered employees, but in the scheme of things, they would not obtain office. And becoming cardinals would not add any real jurisdiction to their jobs. Here things become difficult, because to have true authority and to hold the sort of jurisdiction we think of in the church, specifically oversight of a diocese, but including being a pastor, or even formally being a chaplain, one must at least be a priest. And the church, as of this morning, is not phoning up women asking them to be priests or bishops. The canonical distinction comes from the notion of the headship of Christ for the church and the theological notion that the priest is ordained to serve in persona Christi Capitus Ecclesiae, in the person of Christ, the head of the church. Having said that, there are specific instances where women have governing authority and jurisdiction in their own right, as prioresses of enclosed orders of nuns or as abbesses of territorial abbeys. Women can also administer such authority on behalf of another, typically as vicars for religious, functioning for the diocesan bishop. But in just about every instance I can think of where a lay person, and let us not forget, all women are lay persons, in every instance I can think of where a lay person has any authority or jurisdiction in the church, he or she is not within the system. That is, he or she is not in the clerical chain of command, as it were, of church jurisdiction and authority. So yes, we can have women cardinals, but no woman would come upon that appointment by dint of her authoritative or jurisdictional role in the church. And becoming a cardinal would not bring with it any authority or jurisdiction. It would bring with it the opportunity to be cast in an advisory role to the pope going back to our statistics to even things up a bit, to represent the whole church, you would need at least four women cardinals to talk about the curial reform, the place of the Vatican State Department, and the role of the laity. That's not going to happen. To be clear, I genuinely dislike those sorts of democratic, demographic choices. I believe you choose the best possible person for the job. 
But to simply look at the question of perspective, what we see is how we know what we know about what the hierarchical church thinks of women. And I also think the hierarchical church needs to admit to the fact and genuinely consider that women see things differently from men. It's a matter of either belonging to or not belonging to the clerical caste. I applaud the coming synod on the laity. I recognize the absolutely crucial roles lay men and lay women have in our church. But in order to have any governing authority and jurisdiction, the individual must belong to the clerical state. So here comes the O word. Can a woman be ordained? There are two answers to this question. Yes and no. As it happens, both are correct. The church has given reasons why women cannot be ordained as priests and by implication as bishops. In 1976, the curial document Inter and Signoris presented two main objections. First, the iconic argument, the priest must image Christ. And second, the argument from authority, Jesus chose male apostles. In 1994, the papal document Ordinatio Sacerdotalis restated the argument from authority. But Ordinatio Sacerdotalis does not restate the iconic argument and for a very real reason. It is supremely insulting to half the human race as well as theologically illiterate to say that women cannot image the risen Christ. The symbolism of the church's sacramental system always points to the resurrection, always points to the risen Lord. It is the Christ whom the priest represents, not the restricted human male Jesus. More importantly for my work, each of these documents specifically leaves aside the question of restoring women to the ordained diaconate. It would seem a simple thing to do. The history of women ordained to the diaconate is well known, although argued negatively in one small corner of contemporary theological history. In 1974, the noted Eastern liturgy scholar and member of the International Theological Commission, Cipriano Vagagini, Kamaldeliz published a paper he reportedly wrote in response to Paul VI's question on whether women could be ordained to the diaconate. In 15,000 words, Vagagini said yes. Also in the 1970s, the noted liturgist Roger Grisson wrote a book an analyzing for the 20th century the documented history of women who ministered in the Christian diaconate, East and West. Grisson's work was countered by Aimé Georges Marimort, who admitted the facts of history, but who said that women were never sacramentally ordained and that a woman cannot image Christ. Marimort's use of the iconic argument appears in the International Theological Commission's 2002 document on the diaconate, and it has also been retooled by two more contemporary theologians, Sarah Butler, a member of the International Theological Commission, and Gerhard Mueller, prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. The real logic, as it were, is that women cannot be ordained deacons because women cannot be ordained priests. However, the unspoken converse is their real problem. If a woman can be ordained deacon, then she can also be ordained priest. But the church has said more or less definitively that it does not have the authority to ordain women as priests. So to argue that ordaining a woman as deacon automatically qualifies her for priesthood is to disagree with what many find is the definitive teaching of the church. The church does not have the authority to ordain women to the priesthood. The fact of the matter is that any Catholic can receive any sacrament unless impeded by law. And it is by law, the fact that the church teaches and believes it does not have the authority to ordain women as priests. It is law that restricts women from priesthood. To confer a sacrament, one must intend to do as the church does. That is, to confer the sacrament of orders, one must intend to be in union and communion with the whole church. I think right now the argument is is whether or not the teaching about women as priests is irreformable, whether it can be changed. But for our purposes, let us take the position that the teaching cannot be changed, that women cannot be ordained as priests because the church does not have the authority to ordain women as priests. But then there's the diaconate. 
The deacon is ordained to the ministry, not to the priesthood. And the ordinary means of entering the clerical state is by ordination to the diaconate. And, 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 it, and to obtain office in the church, one must be a cleric. And let's not forget that there are three ranks of cardinals, cardinal bishop, cardinal priest, and cardinal deacon. Why bother? Why should any woman bother getting involved in the clerical case, especially at the rank of deacon? Deacons do little, if anything, anyway, and what they do is mostly do for free. What difference would it make if a woman, any woman, was ordained as deacon? Well, why not? There are 153 fishes in the Sea of Peter. Why not an ordained woman among them? There are many reasons, internal and external to the church, why women should, and I would say must, be restored to their rightful places in the order of deacon. The internal reasons are natural and to my mind obvious. The role of the deacon is to minister and live the word, the liturgy, and charity. The word. You know, it's the deacon who is charged with the gospel to live it, to carry it to the people. It is the deacon who studies the word and who prays the word and who preaches the word of God. Charity. It is the deacon who in the early church received congregants' gifts at the church door. Some were brought to the altar at the offertory and became the Eucharistic food and drink. Some gifts were given to the needy. Finally, the deacons paid the priests. I think women are sometimes more inclined to find aid for the poor. Remember Mother Teresa, or think of Dorothy Day. Or think of the hundreds of thousands of women religious, there are about 400,000 in the world today, who minister to the ill, the destitute, the uneducated, the dying, and whose ministries, for the most part, are self-incorporated and self-funded. And then the liturgy. In the liturgy, it is the deacon who symbolically and really is the go-between the priest and the people. Just as in ancient times, the ordained woman deacon handled matters concerning women on behalf of the bishop, so today, symbolically and really, it is the deacon who speaks directly to the people and in the mass. It is the deacon who preaches, and rightly so, because it is the deacon who, theoretically at least, is mostly, most directly connected to the word lived through the church's charity, what does one preach about? What else should one preach about? The internal reasons for ordaining women as deacons move beyond the actual functions of the deacon because these functions, while common to every deacon, are what support other service he, and we hope she, can render to the people of God through the church as an organization. Recall, if you will, the deacon, deacon ministers in persona Christi Servi in the person of Christ, the servant. I've heard the expression to obtain office here this evening. Only a cleric can formally obtain office in the church. While there are some offices deacons cannot obtain, there are a few they can, and a few others to which they would more easily be appointed. Parish administrator comes to mind, simply because they are clerics. The church is bound, some say bound up, by canon law. And the canons restrict the laity from sharing governance and authority within any clerical structure. But the deacon can, in addition to performing the ministries of the word, the liturgy, and charity, the deacon can minister through governance and authority and can be delegated to so minister. The typical example is the woman chancellor of a diocese who cannot sign many documents because she is not a cleric, or a woman judge on a diocesan or metropolitan tribunal who may write a single judgment, but may not render it, may not sign it. Legalities aside, there's the external witness the ordained woman would bring to the world. The Cleveland priest and writer Donald Cousins included the question in his latest book, Notes from the Underground, Spiritual Journal of a Secular Priest. Cousins asks us to imagine a pontifical mass in St. Peter's Basilica where half the servers are female and the deacon proclaiming the gospel is also female. Yes, imagine that. And imagine what that would say to the female victims of human trafficking, of dowry burnings, of FGM, of rape, of incest, of every sort of indignity and crime committed against women and girls in every corner of the planet. If half the church 
was represented symbolically next to those Bernini pillars, right up there at the throne of Peter. What would that say to those who suffer? And what would that say to those who perpetrate these violences, large and small? What even would it say to those whose coarse remarks and wolf whistles plague the days of hundreds and thousands of women and girls? Imagine, if you will, the ordained woman vested as deacon at that papal mass. The fact of the woman there carrying the gospel book would demonstrate to those inside and outside the bark of Peter that the church proclaims really as well as symbolically, the church proclaims that women can and do participate in the resurrection, that women can and do represent Christ. It's not only possible, it's critical for the life of the church and for the life of the world. That dull November evening when, when I sat at the conference table in the old cardinal's residence with, as you must know, with Cardinal Law, I asked him about women as deacons. As I recall, he said he did not have any problem with women as acolytes or as lectors, or even as deacons if the church allowed it. So I told him that if he would ordain me a deacon, I would promise him obedience and I would stay within the Archdiocese of Boston for the rest of my life. And Cardinal Law said, what time is your plane back to New York, Phyllis? <laughs> That was in 1987. It's now 2013. The church has new leadership and new hope. The way to the future for women in ministry is through the ordained diaconate. I am convinced of it. And let's not forget that on that plane ride back from Rio, Francis gave a fairly unqualified yes to women as deacons. I hope so. I really do. I hope so for our sake, for, for the sake of our church, and for the sake of our world. Thank you. Thank you.